so often on Sunday mornings I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. And I often wonder sometimes, God, why did you give me this message? I'm not sure it's what anybody really needs to hear. But then, somewhere along the way, his message comes through and it's exactly what someone needs to hear. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the ways that God's presence has been made manifest and revealed to us. We've talked about a personal relationship with God from an Old Testament perspective. We've looked at passages from Isaiah, from Psalms, from Jonah. We looked at them all from God's hand and revelation through Old Testament. But this morning, I'm going to bring a message from the New Testament. I would remind us all that the purpose of Epiphany in the church year is to bring us very special attention to the closeness of God in our daily lives. Of how God's presence is made manifest to us even when we're not aware of it. This morning's focus passage from the Gospel of Mark, I think, is another shining example of his presence. And I think it also gives us an idea of how we can take notice of it. I'm reading from Mark 1, starting with verse 21. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the region of Galilee. Like much of scripture, when we read this particular passage, we get so wrapped up in the exorcism that takes place in the synagogue that we can easily miss the message that the writer was trying to get us to understand. Most of us have little or no experience with exorcisms, except from Linda Blair's head turning in a Hollywood movie. And I can count the number of friends I have that cannot eat split pea soup now because of that movie. I don't want anyone here to think I'm making light of exorcism or demon possession. I don't want anyone here to think that I don't believe in demon possession because I do. I think it's very real. I think it's very scriptural. I don't anyone, want anyone here to believe that I don't believe in the power of God through his willing servants to exercise demons and to call them out just as Jesus did that day. But if we only look at that part of our lesson today, I think we'll miss the relevance that it has in our lives. How easily it would be to read that passage and say, well, that really doesn't have anything to do with me because I don't know anyone that's demon-possessed, and so therefore we just skip over that part of the chapter and move right on. And by doing that, we miss a, a very important message that's held within those words. There's a tremendous amount of substance to the passage, even without the miraculous exorcism that we've witnessed in Jesus' presence in the synagogue. And it's that other message that I would like for us to look at this morning. In today's gospel, Jesus has come to the synagogue in Capernaum, and the first thing we're told is that he has begun to teach the people. What amazes the people that he is teaching is that he's teaching as one who has authority 
even though he doesn't hold the office. He's not the Sanhedrin. He's not a scribe. He's not a priest. He's not a judge. He's this itinerant carpenter coming into the temple and preaching with authority. He speaks as one who knows the truth and who declares the truth. In this election year, I think we've all been subjected to debates and speeches and mudslinging ad nauseum. Thank heavens it's in Florida and out of South Carolina now. Amen. But have you noticed that when one of the candidates wants to talk about how they're going to fix education, they go to a school or a university to make their speech, or when they want to talk about expanding the economy or creating jobs, they go to a factory or a business, Jesus wanted to teach people about who God was and what he wanted in their lives. What he had planned for this world. What his purpose was in this world. And so he goes to the most natural place in the world to do that. He goes to the synagogue to teach where people are there to learn. Jesus sets a good example for us by attending church on the Sabbath. He goes where those people who want to learn are located. He goes into the presence of those who have gathered for the common purpose. If we want to find and feel God's presence, I think we have to find ourselves in the place where God is most likely to be too. A place where people with common goals and common needs have come together to meet the holy. Notice in today's scripture reading that Jesus is not teaching one-on-one. -on -one. He does that a lot in his travels. He does one-on-one -on -one with all kinds of people. But in today's passage, he's teaching a congregation. He's teaching a group of people that have gathered in community. You know, our spiritual journey is more than just God and us. That's a very important thing, and we talk so much about our personal relationship with Jesus because that is a foundation of Christianity. But sometimes, in our individualistic society, we make it so individual that we forget about the importance of community, how important it is to be a part of a faith community. At our baptism, most of us heard the words from our pastor that baptized us, where the Christians in the congregation promised to support, nurture us. Even here at this church, even though we don't do a lot of baptisms, we have what we call our right of membership. And when we have this right of membership, we promise to love, support, and encourage each other with our presence. Every time there are empty chairs here, it may be a taking away a blessing that somebody needs from you that day. We are a people in communion with God and with one another. Being in a faith community is essential to our spiritual growth and well-being. So many people say, well, you know, I can worship God just fine in nature. I can worship Him on the golf course or in the boat fishing or... I'm sorry, you're not going to get the same spiritual high teeing off the 18th tee box as you are sitting amongst the people who have gathered to be in communion with God. It's not going to happen. So often I talk with people who tell me about how things just aren't going really well in their lives and things aren't working out for them. And they're quick to add that they miss church and they miss all the people in the church and they miss all the things that go on at the church and this, that, and the other. But then they have this tidy little list of reasons for why they couldn't be here. Well, I had to go here and I had to do this and I had to be there. There are legitimate reasons for missing church. There really are, and I understand them. 
But so many times when people are giving me this list of reasons why they're not here at church, they don't fall within my list of legitimate reasons. <laughs> they fall within my list of, I want to be selfish. <laughs> My best pastoral voice when I talk to these folks without a hint of sarcasm, I gently try to remind them of the power that is found within the Christian community. I don't try and make false promises about how, well, if you came to church, everything would be all right. Your life would be working out just fine. Nothing would be going wrong in your life. It would just come. But I do remind them that there's an unmistakable power to be found in the midst of God's people who are praising and praying. There was a member of the church who had previously been attending services, and all of a sudden he just kind of quit going. And after a few weeks, the preacher decided he'd pay him a visit. And it was a cold winter night, and so when he got to the man's house, the man opened the door, and of course, sees the preacher standing there, and he knows why he's there, because he hasn't been in several weeks. And invites the pastor in, and they go into the den, and the man has a fire going in the fireplace. They sit in a couple of chairs in front of the fireplace. They really don't say much. They exchange a few pleasantries. But as they sat in front of that fireplace, they both just stared into the fireplace. And then the pastor got up and he took the fire tongs and he reached in and he pulled an ember out of the fire and just put it down on the fireplace, on the hearth. And he sat back down, and they sat there in silence for a little longer and exchanged a few more pleasantries. And the man watched as the ember that was on the hearth began to grow cold. And it flickered and it flamed for a little while, and then it grew colder, and finally it died out. And about that time, the minister looked at his watch, and he says, well, I think it's time for me to go. But before he left, he took the tongs and he picked that ember back up and he put it back into the fire. And within a minute, it was glowing again. It was hot. It was warm. It was right at home in the rest of the coals that were in that fireplace. And as he made his way to the door, he noticed the tear rolling down the old man's eye, cheeks. And he said, um, thank you for coming by tonight. And I especially enjoyed your fiery sermon. <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs> Attending church regularly is the best way I know to have the presence of God magnified in our lives. Amen. We all need the church to be that special place that's set apart from the rest of the world where we can feel God's special presence. I'm not saying that you don't feel God's presence in your own personal prayer time. I'm not saying you don't feel it when you're reading the scripture. I'm not saying it that you don't feel it when you're driving down the road listening to music. I think we can feel God's presence all the time. But I'm saying that we all need, as busy human beings in the day of internet and texting and phone calls that, you know, with phones that we wear on our sides and just this information overload, we sometimes need that very special place to go where we shut out everything else and simply feel God's presence. We, when we come here, we can feel God's presence in a number of ways. There may be a very particular or special song that is sung that just touches our hearts. Maybe that's the blessing we get today. It may be that we have a prayer need that needed to be shared. And by hearing that prayer said aloud, all of a sudden it goes from being my problem to our problem. And you know, instead of me just praying for it by myself, I've got 20 people praying for it instead of just me. Maybe it's just the touch or the embrace or the feel of another human being hugging you during the passing of the peace that you need to sleep. To know that you're not walking this journey by yourself. For a church our size, I think we not only offer meaningful worship, but we offer some wonderful biblical teaching in Sunday school. We offer a great Wednesday night small group meeting. 